Praxis Award in Professional Ethics. My name is Mark Dorley. I'm the director of the Ethics Program in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and um, I'm very grateful that you're here. Um, the Ethics Program inaugurated this annual event in the spring of 2007. Our commitment was simple. Recognize and celebrate an individual for his or her outstanding commitment to the ethical ideals of his or her profession. We have been fortunate to have amazing people come to spend time with us and to receive our award. With Judge Mark Carter of Houston, God continues to bless us with extraordinary people. I am very grateful, again, that you're all here to help us to celebrate uh, Judge Carter and his work and to support the vision of the Praxis Award. I do want to take this time to point out some particular people for a word of gratitude. This event would not be possible without the financial support and sponsorship of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the College of Nursing, the College of Engineering, and the Villanova School of Business. So to the deans of those colleges, Dean Linney, Dean Fitzpatrick, who will join us later, Dean Gabriel, and Dean McGiddy, my deepest appreciation for your generosity and support. I also want to recognize my faculty colleagues in the ethics program. Mark Wilson, Cynthia Nielsen, Kevin Vanderschel, Peter Wicks, and Brett Wilmot, who's teaching, but will be here in a little bit. And last, I'd like everyone, uh, if we could give a round of applause to Mrs. for Mrs. Mary Quilter, my administrative assistant. She put all the details together. And I also want to thank our student workers, Aravelli, Justin, and Ashley, who have, as always, helped Mrs. Quilter with, with ready assistance. So before I introduce uh, Judge Carter, I'd like to invite Dr. Jean Ann Linney, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, to come forward for a few remarks. Thank you, Mark. In my role as Dean of the College, I um, am frequently asked to make opening remarks or welcoming remarks for these sorts of awards. And I have to say, um, the Praxis Award is my very favorite one. Um, in my mind, it embodies everything that Villanova is about. Um, as Mark said, this award is designed to celebrate a person of extraordinary commitment to the ideals of his or her profession. Um, we, what's unique about this award is that the person can be in any profession. We have, we have at least two other awards that are very significant here at Villanova, but you have to be in a certain discipline or a certain kind of uh, um, specialty in order to be eligible. And, um, and I think what's really valuable about this award is it recognizes that the Augustinian values uh, that we espouse with, 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 with um, deep commitment, um, our commitment to veritas, unitas, and caritas can be displayed no matter what walk of life we, we pursue. Um, I think the other thing that is really important and special about this event is it's an opportunity for our students to, to see examples of the kind of um, meaningful life that we hope every one of our graduates will pursue. So I am delighted to be here. Um, I was talking with, Dr. with uh, Judge Carter beforehand. I have done um, probably 10 years of research in the juvenile justice system. And um, my husband served as a juvenile probation officer for about seven years. and. Um, there were so many young people whose lives I saw um, severely limited because of the ways in which our systems treated them and the lack of opportunity for them. So when, um, when Mark Dorley sent me the information about you, Judge Carter, he sent me some, uh, I think it was a 60 Minutes clip and a oh. few other things, and I thought, I can't wait to meet this man. So we are deeply honored to have you here, and, um, and, and we look forward to hearing a little bit more about the things that you've done. So thank you, Dean Lenny. So before we get to the presentation of the award and uh, the lecture, I'd like to explain briefly the selection process. Each spring, we seek nominations for the following year's award. In fact, the call for nominations for next year is available in this room. It's probably sitting at, at your, at your uh, chair. So please, the deadline is the 20th of April. It's a good date to remember. It's Easter. So um, your resurrection duty is to give a nomination. 
So these nominations are then vetted by a committee made up of representatives from each of the undergraduate professional colleges and the law school, as well as four members of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I'd like to introduce the members of that committee. Uh, Professor Wilmot, the Associate Director of the Ethics Program. Uh, Professor Barbara Ott of the College of Nursing, who's here. Um, Professor Frank Falcone of the College of Engineering, who's teaching, but will be here later. Professor Brian Ota of Chemistry. Professor Karen Hollis of the Department of English. Um, Professor Nick Rangione of the Villanova School of Business, and most recently, Michelle Dempsey of the School of Law. I serve as the chair of that committee, and we met last April and discussed our nominations, and uh, Judge Carter won the lottery. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it's very difficult. I was telling him this earlier today. It's very difficult when you have several nominations and you've got to pick one. It, it's, it, the choice of one person is not to slight the, F, the, the, the lives and the work of the others. It's just that you gotta, they only have one award, so we have to choose somehow. So anyway, so it's our tradition here um, that the person who nominates someone for this award is the one who introduces them. Well, since I nominated Judge Carter, I get that honor. So it's a wonderful privilege to introduce to you uh, this man who presides over the 228th District Court in Harris County, Texas, and the first Veterans Court program in the state of Texas. I think we ought to honor Judge Carter for his creative use of the power of the courts to address the particular challenges that face U.S. veterans upon their return from combat, particularly those who are back from Afghanistan or Iraq. He saw men and women in his court every day who had crossed the line into illegal conduct. They served their time, were put on probation, and invariably violated, violated their probation because the underlying factors contributing to their criminal behavior were never addressed. He took action along with other leaders in Houston to do something about it. That program is now replicated in over 25 jurisdictions. In fact, he told me today there, there are maybe as many as 100 veterans courts around the United States. Uh, not all necessarily following Judge Carter's design, but certainly uh, addressing the similar kind of problems. And the, and the number is growing steadily. The mission of the Veterans Court program is to increase access to mental health and addictions treatment for those veterans with felony and misdemeanor offenses by diverting veterans directly into VA treatment, reducing jail time, costs, and criminal recidivism, while improving mental health recovery and successful reentry into the community. Judge Carter's program collaborates with the DeBakey Veterans Hospital to provide clients with mental health and drug treatment as well as job training and housing. So why is this man worthy of the Praxis Award? The award was inaugurated to honor people who exemplify the highest ethical ideals of his or her profession. These are people who connect their professional work to the common good and who champion ethical excellence within the circles of their peers. There is no question that Judge Carter has done this and will continue to do so. What's the primary role of a judge? It is to adjudicate conflicts. It is to set right what has been upset by the behavior of human beings or collections of human beings. When the veteran came before the court, having violated the law of the land, Judge Carter's job was to facilitate a fair trial and to set a just punishment. He did that. However, justice in our land is not only about retribution, but it is also about rehabilitation, if not reconciliation. The goal is to set things right that have been upset. The returning veteran suffering from the wounds, sometimes the hidden wounds of war, will not be set right by repeated sojourns in prison. What Judge Carter did and what he does is to be judicious. That is, he recognized that setting right in the situation of many returning warriors had to be more than merely sending them to prison over and over again. He crafted a response to the criminal behavior of the returning warrior that not only met the demands of retributive justice, but also addressed the demands of rehabilitation and indeed approaches the demands of reconciliation. Justice seeks reconciliation between the man or woman sent off to war and the community to which he or she returns. Judge Carter's commitment to his community 
and to the men and women who come before his court, gave birth to this creative response to the challenge of returning warriors in his community. For his commitment to the highest ideals of his profession, for his willingness to fight for the realization of those ideals in his community, and for his readiness to share his experience with others, I nominated Judge Mark Carter for the 2014 Praxis Award in Professional Ethics. So it is with profound gratitude for his service to his country, not only as a soldier, but now as a judge in our justice system, that I invite Judge Carter forward to receive the Praxis Award in Professional Ethics. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this, this clock says, the Praxis Award in Professional Ethics, Judge Mark Carter, in recognition of his commitment to professional integrity, presented the 10th day of April, 2014, the Ethics Program, Villanova University. All right, thank you so much. All right. This will hang proudly in my chambers. Yeah. There's also, a, there's also an honorarium that comes with this award, but Judge Carter told me he didn't want it. So I'm not, <laughs> not going to ask him any more questions. Right. <laughs> Judge Carter. Uh, well, I, I thank you. And, that, and, you know, to the honorarium, I, I appreciate it. But, you know, this is, this is what I do. And um, it's just really an honor for me to come down here and do this. And it didn't, in, in my world anyway, it didn't seem right to receive any money <laughs> for this. So I didn't, uh, I chose not to. But what I like to do is um, I want to talk to you just a little bit uh, about uh, the Veterans Court and uh, just spend some time talking about not only uh, my court but you know the our military our military's mission and these things so I want to start by thanking Villanova uh, for recognizing veterans and the sacrifices that our men and women in the armed forces make for us Second, I want to thank you for the Praxis Award, uh, but it's really a team effort, and uh, this honor, you know, doesn't belong to me, but it belongs to my team of dedicated social workers, uh, doctors, lawyers, and uh, those that share my passion, uh, not only for the military, but for humanity. Um, now, I know that I have some veterans in this room. Are there some veterans here? Please stand. I know we have at least one. Yeah, there you go. All right, let's give me a hand. Now, when you, when you leave here today, um, there's one thing that, that I really want you to take with you, and that is that the overwhelming majority of our veterans are just like um, the gentleman that stood here. Uh, typically, military veterans rise to the top of the civilian world in every field of human endeavor. And uh, they do this in spite of injuries uh, to include PTSD. And um, I know that you were Air Force, uh, but they have, uh, and, and so people, I, I've always asked, you know, why, why is this that veterans really um, tend to do so well? Um, and it takes me back to my creed as a soldier, as an Army officer. Um, every soldier has a creed. And it goes like this, the soldier's creed. I'm an American soldier. I am a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and I live the army values. I will always place my mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I'm disciplined, physically and mentally tough, trained and proficient in my warrior task and drills. I always maintain my arms, my equipment, and myself. I am an expert. I am a professional. I stand ready to deploy, engage, and destroy the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I am a guardian of freedom and the American way. I am an American soldier. These veterans, the veteran that was standing here, you know, you live by this. You live by your creed and the warrior ethos. Uh, they carry that mentality with them into their civilian employment, school, and in my opinion, that's one of the reasons why these 
individuals are successful in civilian life as well. They have a creed that they live by. But oddly enough, most of the resistance that I had uh, to creating the Veterans Court came from this group of, of uh, veterans. In other words, I'm okay. I did fine. In fact, I achieved more than most, and I served in combat too. Uh, I call it the General Patton glove slap attitude uh, towards uh, those who have difficulty coping. We all remember that. We all recall that. But I remind them of the warrior ethos. I leave no, no fallen comrade behind. Uh, these men and women are injured, and they need our help. My concern is that the small fraction of veterans, my concern is that small fraction of veterans that cannot make the, tr the transition to civilian life, the ones that suffer from injuries both mental and physical and cannot cope, the ones that decide that drugs and alcohol are the answers to their nightmares, depression, low self-worth. And I worry about the ones that never reach out for help until they come into the criminal justice system or worse, commit suicide. Currently, we lose about 20 veterans a day to suicide. And those are just the suicides we can confirm, but um, I can imagine <coughs> those numbers would, could be greater. Uh, what do we do in my profession as lawyers, judges, and students? And I, I say the first thing that we need to do is we have to understand the issues that affect uh, change and then and have to understand the, the, the issues and then make a change in any way we can, great or small. Uh, so today I want to spend time talking about some changes that I've seen in this country and in our military. I want to talk about my personal history and experiences and attempt to demonstrate these changes and then tie them into the need for veterans courts and explain how these make our communities safer and they also can save our communities money. So my history. Uh, as lawyers, uh, we are truly in a position uh, to affect change in our communities, state or county, uh, we, or country. We can make it a better place. A better place because we treat one another with dignity, uh, respect, and compassion. The first le lesson I learned as a young lawyer was from the Honorable Kenneth M. Hoyt. Uh, he was a, or is, a United States District Court judge. I was lucky uh, when I graduated from law school to secure a clerkship um, with Judge Hoyt. And in that process, um, I learned a very simple lesson. And it happened um, in the courtroom when a young man was charged with a very serious crime. Um, he pled guilty, and the case was set for sentencing. At the time, the uh, federal sentencing guidelines were mandatory, and there was very little discretion for judges in determining what was an appropriate sentence. So at the, at the hearing, the government um, prosecution had argued for the maximum sentence, but the judge sentenced the defendant to the low end of the guidelines. Uh, the government was angry, and I could, you know, in fact, feel the tension in the courtroom and their anger. And I remember thinking how courageous uh, this judge was standing up to this pressure of the government. As we walked out of the courtroom and walked back to his chambers, um, he said, There, but for the grace of God, go I. The comment was not directed to me, but I heard him say it to himself as he walked to Chambers. It was his courage and recognition of mercy and compassion that made me feel good about being a lawyer, about being his clerk in humanity. There, but for the grace of God, go I, has been my mantra ever since. I know uh, that you want to hear about the Veterans Court, but... Um, you know, it's these stories and these events that led to, you know, my participation and the creation of my court. So I want to give you uh, some of my family history and some of the, again, some of my experiences that brought me here 
today to Villanova. I was born in 1959 in Bad Kreuznach, Germany. All right. My father uh, was a first lieutenant at the time in the United States Field Artillery. Uh, my parents actually met at West Virginia State College in the 50s um, at a time when schools in that state were segregated. It was the only college in that state that admitted black students at the time. So I grew up in an interesting era, in an interesting time. The country was evolving through the 60s, and of course, um, we had committed troops to fight in South Vietnam uh, to defend against communism. In 1968, I was nine years old uh, when my father went to Vietnam. That, of course, was the height of U.S. involvement uh, with hundreds of thousands of men and women serving. And that was a very different situation than, our, than we have today. And we hear talk um, all the time about how badly that generation of soldiers were treated. And I know firsthand, uh, because being old enough to see and process the hate that was directed towards our troops. But now, uh, when I look back, I believe that it was not hate towards our troops, but it was really directed at the government that they represented. Our government was taking young men, forcing them to fight. Uh, they were drafted, and the burden of that war disproportionately fell upon America's youth, the poor, and minorities. So when young people across the board were affected by the war, they rose up in protest across America, East Coast, West Coast, North, South, rich, poor, middle class, black, white, and brown. The war that we're fighting today is very different. It still disproportionately falls on the shoulders of our youth, poor, and minorities, but for a completely different reason. It's not because of a draft. Uh, today's military is an all-volunteer military. Initially, many, many of these volunteers were motivated by 9-11, uh, but now they're signing up because they need a job, money for school, or lack options. Of course, I'm not talking about everyone. Uh, some sign up because they're legacies, like I was, um, or my, my nephew, and others just simply want the challenge of being a Marine. You know, so there are hundreds of reasons, but it's very different than it was when we had a draft. But I'm referring to the experiences and the trends that, that I have seen. So in my courtroom, you know, if you only, if you only saw how many um, kids came into the courtroom after an arrest to say they were planning on going into the military. And I asked them why, and their response is, well, it was my best option. And of course, I tell them that today's military is not where you want to go to find yourself. You better have your, your stuff together before you join uh, because you'll be in for a very rude awakening. So the question I have asked myself over the past few years is, uh, you know, what does that say about our country? Um, how has that affected the length of this war? And are, you know, why are we still fighting this war? Why is this generation of veterans treated so differently from the Vietnam era uh, veterans? It's complicated, but I'm going to suggest an oversimplified answer to all of the questions. It's because it's an all-volunteer army or military. Americans can choose not to participate. Therefore, there is no rage like there was in the 60s. In other words, parents don't have to worry about the government snatching up their children and sending their kids and sending them off to war. You don't have to worry about that today. People with means can create options for their children, and they do that. Uh, these people are also the same ones that are most likely to vote and affect our government. Today, you can go about your life and never give Afghanistan or Iraq or the men and women that fight those wars a second thought if you choose. So the question I ask is, do you think we would still be in this war if there was compulsory service, a draft? I'm not advocating for compulsory service. <laughs> uh, but what I am saying is that citizens need to make decisions about wars and conflict like there was compulsory service. 
If the war is not important enough for you to send your children, then it's probably not important enough for you to send somebody else's. It's the bottom line. If you're not willing to send your, your kids, then nobody's children should go. That's my personal opinion. Um, you may not agree, and that's okay. In fact, I encourage uh, debate. You know, that's okay. Um, but I'm going to give you a few more background details details about me and, um, and then how that created the uh, Harris County Veterans Court. So as you know, my father was a career um, Army officer, but my brother Mike was too. Um, I served in the Army, but I chose not to make the Army a career. I resigned my commission in 1988 um, at the rank of captain, and uh, I married uh, my wife, Rosvita, instead of going to the 82nd Airborne. Uh, so it's a good decision on my part. Uh, but I have a, another brother um, who actually broke ranks. And so rather than going into the Army, he went into the Air Force. Uh, but he currently works for the uh, Department of Veteran Affairs. And of course, I'm very proud of him too, um, in spite of the fact that he's an Air Force guy. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, um, I have a, a nephew that graduated from West Point. And he is currently serving with the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, he is a helicopter pilot. And that was one of the discussions that I had, is that now there are more pilots in the Army than there are the Air Force. Uh, so that's an interesting, an, an, another interesting change. So you can see that the roots, the military roots in my family go very deep. Um, after I completed that clerkship with Judge Hoyt, I went to the Harris County District Attorney's Office in 94. Uh, I was amazed at how many criminal defendants at that time were veterans and Vietnam era veterans. Um, I had empathy and compassion for them uh, because the vast majority of their offenses had to do with drugs and alcohol. Um, this was uh, nothing new and it seemed to be something that this country had pretty much written off um, that era. In fact, uh, as a law clerk in 1993, I was surprised to learn that the sentencing guidelines would not permit a judge to consider an offender's military service in determining an appropriate sentence. So even if you served in the military, a judge could not even consider that in determining what would be appropriate sentence. So in theory, you could have a Medal of Honor and, and commit an offense, and the judge could not even consider that. Uh, never made. Uh, I never understood that, only to conclude that the government did not value uh, soldiers uh, or their service when it came to sentencing. Now, in November of 2003, I was appointed to the 228th Criminal District Court as judge. Um, at that time, we had already committed troops to the war in Afghanistan, and this was, uh, this was the new lean and mean military. Uh, that stormed the Gulf War in 1990. Now I'll explain. Um, in that war, we had uh, overwhelming firepower, fast attack, and then uh, we returned without the burden of occupation or nation building. Uh, what Americans did not realize at the time was that the time of the first Gulf War was that our military had changed its mission significantly uh, just a few years before after the fall of the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall and the unification of Germany. So for 50 years prior, uh, part of the military mission uh, included occupation. Uh, we did that in Europe as well as in Asia. But in 1990, there was never a plan to occupy Iraq. Um, that's why we stopped, of course, short of Baghdad, and there was not total destruction of the Iraqi government or infrastructure. Uh, we, we went in, we did our job, we came home. We, we're not forced to occupy. Then came the second uh, Gulf War. In that war, uh, we destroyed the, the Iraqi military, the government, uh, and the government, which increased our military mission to include occupation and nation building. And if that was not enough, uh, we were required to do this with, our, with a military that, of course, was a lot smaller and relied on reserve units uh, to do that, rather than the regular army units that had completed these missions in the years prior. Now, uh, General Wesley Clark on uh, CNN in September 2013 uh, said, and I uh, paraphrase what he said, 
Well, he said that the uh, modern military was not designed to be an occupation force. As a result, military personnel have been required to make multiple deployments that result in prolonged exposure to combat. He said, never before have we asked so much from our men and women in combat. Prolonged exposure and multiple deployments have resulted in injuries that the Department of Defense in previous wars did not even admit existed. So consider this. In World War II, the average exposure to combat was about six months. I mean, your grandfather, he might, he might be shipped away and gone for three years, but his actual exposure in combat was about six months. In Vietnam, the average was about 13 months. I remember my father leaving. Uh, well, actually, he, he left, and it was, I was kind of surprised to wake up that morning and realize that he had actually gone to Vietnam. I didn't understand. Um, but I certainly remember him coming home. Uh, but the average, the average was about 13 months, and that's how long he was gone. And now you have this generation of soldiers, and the average combat exposure is 40 months. 40 months. Um, so again, this is the result of a country relying on a smaller force to do a job that it was not designed to do, and that is occupation and nation building. So by 2008, I saw a phenomenal increase in the number of veterans being booked into the Harris County Jail. Um, Harris County is, is one of the largest counties in the country. And we had between three and 400 veterans booked into the county jail every month. That's a significant number. Uh, but when you look at the overall jail population, it appears to be a drop in a bucket, but it is a significant enough number that you can help. Um, but not only that, not only was the jail population increased, but uh, the, the makeup of that population had dramatically um, changed. Uh, for decades, again, we were used to seeing Vietnam era veterans in the system, uh, older, but now there was this new generation of young veterans and uh, that were coming into the system. This population was not only younger, but, and they, but now not only were they young men, but they were also women. Women were coming into the uh, system. Suicide rates had become alarming, uh, and the Department of Defense at this time had finally recognized post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injuries. So um, we were gaining awareness. Now, um, the tipping point came for me when a young man, young man named Marty Gonzalez, was charged uh, with the felony in my court. His offense was that he abused painkillers while driving a car with a child passenger. That's a felony. He fell asleep at the wheel and ran off the road into the side of a home. Luckily, no one was hurt. His first appearance in my court, I had no idea who he was or what his history was, but his lawyer approached me and said that he wanted to see if he could um, talk to the state and get the state to agree to a pretrial diversion. A pretrial diversion is an agreement between the state and the defendant where the accused uh, does not enter a plea, but he is uh, supervised and goes through a rehabilitation or maybe community service and other, and other um, uh, goals. And then the case is dismissed and his record of arrest and everything is uh, expunged behind him. So it is a, a very good outcome uh, for an accused. But in Texas, the home of mothers against drunk driving, any offense that had to deal with driving and drinking uh, was, you know, it was unlikely. I'd never heard of anyone ever getting a, a pretrial diversion on that kind of, uh, of an offense. So I thought at the time, okay, good luck, guys. Um, you know, and not knowing anything about Marty. So, in the next appearance, uh, the pretrial diversion packet was presented to me, and I was shocked, shocked to learn Marty Gonzalez's history. You see, Marty was a Marine sergeant with multiple combat tours. 
when he came home from his first deployment, um, his community in North Houston had a parade for him. I mean, he was in the back seat of a convertible, uh, waving, and uh, you know, in the nice welcome home, a hero's welcome. He was a hero who has sustained multiple injuries fighting in Fallujah. He spent the previous year before he came home in San Antonio Hospital, where he underwent multiple surgeries to save his right arm. He had a broken back that required multiple surgeries. In addition to those injuries, he suffered from PTSD and traumatic brain injury. He was awarded two bronze stars with the V for valor. He had three purple hearts. In a single day of combat in Fallujah, his 11-man squad lost five Marines. In close quarter combat. And several under, others were wounded to include Sergeant Marty Gonzalez. On the day he was arrested, he was addicted to painkillers. Suffered from PTSD and TBI. His wife had just served him their divorce papers. In Sergeant Gonzalez's own words, he had gone from hero to zero overnight. It was one of the most sobering moments in my judicial career to see this young, wiry, strapping kid who had fought so valiantly for this country to now be in my courtroom and looking at a term in prison. But there, but for the grace of God, go I. The pretrial diversion was granted, and since then, he has been uh, rehabilitated, remarried, working, taking care of his children, and we remain very good friends today. The few, a few months later, um, I had discussed Marty's case with everybody that I knew. I had a very good friend named uh, Pat McCann. He was a naval, reserve naval commander. Um, and practicing attorney. He, he worked uh, quite a bit and when I was practicing we did a lot of work together and we were having a discussion and I was telling him about Marty and he said, Mark, but wait. He said, I've heard of this initiative in Buffalo, Buffalo, New York, where they're uh, designed to help veterans and get them into uh, treatment programs. And um, I thought, wow, okay, uh, let's do this. So we got this team together, we investigated it, and we decided that we could do this in Houston, that we had a significant population that we could help. So our plan was to go to Austin, the state capital, and create a law that permitted the creation of these specialty courts uh, for veterans and also uh, call for pretrial diversion in the appropriate case. Again, that's where they don't enter a plea and their case is expunged. It was to be the first of its kind and Sergeant Marty Gonzalez agreed uh, to go with me to Austin, address the state legislature, and tell his story. Um, remember, this war was not like other conflicts in the past, and I'd realized uh, that almost all of the state senators on the Judicial Committee in that hearing were not veterans and did not have children fighting the war that Marty fought. I had him put on his uniform, adorn it with his ribbons, and tell his story. I wanted them to know that the defendants or offenders I wanted to help were human beings and had sacrificed far more than they could imagine. The strategy worked, and the gridlock in the Texas State Legislature session that summer uh, had one bill that passed, and that was mine. So. Uh, and, it, and again, it was it was a very uh, one of the proudest moments, and to see Marty go from that person, that broken person in my courtroom, to standing in front of uh, the state senate and telling his story uh, meant so much to me, him, and his family. So um, let me tell you about the Veterans Court. 
we got the legislation passed. And the Veterans Court is a multi-discipline collaboration between the Harris County Probation Department, the uh, Harris County District Attorney's Office, the DeBakey VA Medical Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine, and Mental Health America. Uh, the goal of the court is to reduce jail and prison populations through intensive and comprehensive treatment programs that address addictions, mental health, homelessness, and employment. The idea is that you cannot resolve just one aspect of the client's life. In other words, uh, if you're able to address addiction but not homelessness, it's likely that they will uh, fall back into their addiction. So this is how it works. Uh, veterans are identified when they're booked into the Harris County Jail through our pretrial service department. Once a veteran is identified, they're screened by the VA. Are they a veteran? Um, oddly enough, we have people nowadays coming into the Harris County Court not knowing <laughs> what the Veterans Court entails, saying, oh, I'm a veteran, but they really are not. Um, but they think that, for whatever reason, they think that they're, that they're going to get a pass if they're a veteran, which is not the case, and you'll see. Um, in fact, if you uh, participate in the Veterans uh, Court, the, um, the program is much tougher, much more thorough. There's accountability, and we'll talk about those things. But they're identified, um, and we, again, we ask those questions. Now, if you're, if you're a veteran but you have a dishonorable discharge, uh, well, you cannot participate in our program, um, and that's just one of the rules, one of the exclusions that we have, and there are others. Uh, the veterans meet the basic eligibility requirements. Uh, the case is screened by the assistant district attorney. It is a non-adversarial process or uh, program. The district attorney has a gatekeeping responsibility, though. In other words, they have to agree that the case is appropriate for probation and that the needs of the offender will best be addressed in the veterans court. The case is screened by a medical doctor from Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, that completes a forensic examination and determines mental and physical issues that need to be treated. Uh, the offender's VA records, medical records, um, and history are made available to Veterans Court staff. The program is voluntary. Okay, nobody is forced into it. It's a voluntary program. It is a phase program. Uh, it has four phases. The goals of the client must be achieved to uh, be uh, promoted to the next phase. The first two phases of the program are intensive treatment. Um, it may include inpatient treatment, peer counseling, uh, and peer counseling for PTSD. Uh, the treatment and case management is performed by the VA, and of course the treatment is done by Baylor College of Medicine and their counselors. Um, in the next two phases, the clients are well into their treatment programs and sober. Um, some are in what we call recovery. There's a difference between sobriety and recovery. Um, but that's for another day. Uh, in these phases, the clients are given more freedom, uh, but remain accountable for their actions. Relapses and violations could result in recycling a phase. We know that. If you're in the military, you know what recycling is. Um, and, or more intense uh, inpatient programs or even jail uh, when appropriate. Uh, the the uh, client must be accountable for his actions. Uh, by the time they reach phase four in the program, they've demonstrated uh, sobriety, they're in active recovery, uh, and they're working, uh, and they're in housing. Uh, the only exceptions to work it would be there if they have some kind of disability that does not permit them to work. But they're proud and they want to work. Accountability is one of the most important aspects of the program uh, to accomplish this. The VET team, uh, we meet every week we, uh, and we review staff each case and then we have a docket every two weeks. We look at each individual case, uh, we assess their progress or their regress, whatever it might be, and determine what actions to take for that individual. Now in the staffing you have a forensic doctor, the case manager, probation officers, assistant DAs, there's a defense lawyer involved, as well as myself, the judge. And again, it's a non-adversarial approach because we're looking for solutions, not punishments. Uh, Mental Health America plays a huge part in our program. Um, we found that peer mentoring is, a, is critical 
in the success of these veterans. Uh, Mental Health America trains veterans to be mentors to our clients. The role of the mentor is to be a safe place for clients to go and discuss their challenges. It may be something like helping them with a resume, finding them a suit, or organizing a sober outing for them to attend, or a ball game. They teach the clients how to have healthy relationships and to build trust. Um, they're with them in the community and they guide them, something that probation officers and case managers cannot do. So it's an extra step that you see, and you only see this in veterans courts, but it is something like, I think, like having a sponsor in a uh, um, AA would be. Um, the results, the results when, a, when a client buys in um, are unbelievable. Rather than throw numbers at you, I want to just tell you a couple stories again. Uh, first is a story of First Sergeant Arthur Davis, um, a Marine. A Marine First Sergeant who had six deployments. Three of those deployments were combat. In his last combat tour, he promised uh, the mothers, the wives, and the children of his company that he would bring them all home. And as we know, that's a promise that no matter how well you train your men, how well you execute your mission, that's a promise that only God can keep. He did not bring them all home, and it haunted him. It haunted him, uh, and it made him bitter. He retired from the Corps and left angry and turned to drugs and alcohol to numb the pain. Well, one night... Uh, his neighbors were making too much noise. He asked them to quiet down. Um, they didn't, and he returned with a gun and asked them again. Of course, they quieted down, but at the same time, they called the police, which they you know, rightfully did. Um, he was arrested and placed in, the, in, and then he came to me in the veterans court but through an, and attended months of rehab and counseling. He overcame his addictions. He forgave himself. He reunite, reunited with his family, with his friends, with his war buddies. And now he works for Wounded Warrior Project and he recruits mentors to our Veterans Court that work with, MH, uh, with the Mental Health America. You may have seen his, stories on, his story on the 60 Minutes piece. Um, another young man, an airborne ranger, served in Afghanistan. 26,000 combat hours. 26,000 combat hours as an airborne ranger in Afghanistan. Suffers from PTSD, TBI, and now multiple addictions. When he returned from Afghanistan, his life caved in around him. He lost his wife, his mother, um, he could not maintain a job, and of course, he was now an addict. He came to the vet court after going, going in and out of jail. Um, he was in the revolving door. Um, but through intensive drug treatment and rehabilitation and patience, 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 exposure therapy, he learned how to live drug-free and is now working and sober. Um, I have many stories about um, these men and women. Uh, many of them, again, come to, come to us homeless. Um, but the, the point is that um, these people, we can help. And not only them, but so many people that come into the criminal justice system. But my focus today, of course, is on our veterans. But I want to tell you that prison, prison is not a solution. Um, patience, compassion, treatment are solutions. Why? Because they change behavior. And, I, and I've talked to people about this, that people that go to prison, when they come out, uh, you know, the vast majority of them want to change their life. They want to change. They want to do, they want to do something right. They want to be good. They want to work. But prison, you know, creates... Um, a disability, a lifelong disability. I, I mean, it's no different than having your, you know, your leg chopped off or something. It's a disability 
that um, never goes away and they're never able to overcome because uh, the way this system is, um, you know, they're never forgiven. Uh, once you have a felony conviction, you can't get a home, you can't vote, you can't, um, you know, you may, you want to do right. I've had men and women come into my courtroom and I said, look, you've gone to prison once before uh, for selling drugs. Why are you selling drugs? Well, I have a family to feed and I can't work. Nobody, I cannot get a job at a grocery store. I can't be a sack. I can't do anything. They will not hire me. What am I to do? And this is, this is the, the world, I mean, this is our responsibility. This is the world that we've created for us. When they go to prison, they come back to their home, to that community. But they come back more troubled, uh, with a greater disability than they left. So I want to say programs that focus on changing behavior, okay? That change behavior, if you can take a, a drug addict that's, that's constantly in the system and put him in a program, so instead of him appearing in jail in your courtroom every six months or a year, you, you may, you know, he may relapse. Again, um, there's not a cure. There's no cure for this, but you can give them the tools to cope. So you may see him again, but you may not see him for five years. And you may say, Judge, you know what? I've been sober and I've had this. I've been sober for five years. Let me go back to rehab. Certainly. We'll go back. We're going to work on this. We're going to keep working on this until we get it right. You know, and then maybe I won't see him again for 10 years. So, I mean, that's a victory because uh, these ad the addictions are what they are and people will relapse. But sending them to prison and, and making them felon felons is not a solution. Uh, likewise, with these veterans, I, I had a lot of uh, pushback because a lot of the veterans that I, were try that I was trying to help were not, you know, they were charged with violent offenses. You know, um, that uh, first sergeant marine I was talking about was, was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and an offense that he could have got 20 years in prison for. Um, but rather than send him to prison, he went through a system to process his anger. And he, process, he was able to process his anger and now he contributes in ways and he, he is, you know, that marine, that... that person that dedicated his life to his country. That's who they are. And if you can get them to, to, um, um, to reunite with that person and get beyond the anger and understand that there's still a lot that you can do for your communities. And that's where we have these, that's the direction that we have these veterans going in. Um, and it's, it's very, very uh, powerful. And so um, there's a lot of fear that people have with dealing with the cases that may involve um, you know, you know, some violent offense. But it's been my experience, the experience um, in the veterans is that it's a result of, of traumatic experiences that they've had that they have not been able to process. Now, it's very different uh, than the young man who grows up in a home who, um, you know, ends up beating his spouse because he's you know, he's, that's the way, that's what he's learned. He's seen that. And it's a very different thing. A lot of these, these individuals don't have that same experience. It's traumatic. Sure. It's traumatic seeing your father beat your mother. You know, that's a traumatic experience. But what we have is a way to process their combat experience and doctors that are versed and know how to deal with this exposure therapies and the like. And we've been um, very successful. Uh, we maintain about 60 people in our program at a time, and uh, it's a two-year-long process. And so, uh, again, we've been very successful. So I just want to close by saying veterans courts and other specialty courts that modified behavior are effective tools in making your community safer. Um, and again, I can't think of a worthier population than our veterans. Um, remember... These are the men and women uh, that write a blank check, a blank check to this country that includes, in many cases, their lives. And so I encourage you to support, you know, the veterans in your community. Projects like this, um, talk to your 
you know, to your civic leaders, to your legislators, to your congressmen, everybody, tell them how important this is in other programs like this that change behavior. And I, um, I guarantee you uh, that you will be better for that and your community will too. You'll be thanked. Our future will be thanked because of that. All right, thank you very much. Oh yeah, that's right. Sure. Yes, ma'am. We'll start from the work out uh, from the front, and we'll work back. Judge Carter, thank you so much. It was just uh, an excellent uh, sharing with us, particularly the stories. And I most appreciated number one uh, the history of where we are in terms of the people who serve. And yes. How that has changed. I mean, most people don't have never you know, given that any kind of thought, but I, I'm in a position where I'm, you know, where I, I'm asking these questions. Absolutely. And the, the sense in which, um, I know today the claim is that there are far more suicides than there are men and women who die oh, yes. in Afghanistan and right. Iraq. And that is a very serious issue and concern, obviously, as, as you heighten. So the work that you're doing is extraordinary. I'm one person, however, that is um, is very interested in pushing for mandatory service for all young people. And it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily have to be military, but two right. years of service as an opportunity before college to give back. It's what I call buying in. Yes. You know, and in I, most countries that you go to, there is some process where young people buy in. I don't. I don't disagree with that. With that either. I think. Uh, I mean, you know, I. I served in the military, and, and you know, my my, my brothers and father and nephew and and so many others. But there's so many ways that you can that you can serve your country. It doesn't have to be in the military. It can be, you know. Um, I I think it was that Justin is doing Teach for America, right? I mean, that's wonderful service. Uh, those kinds of things are so are so wonderful. Um, but it's part of the buying in. It's it's something bigger than yourself. And at the end of the day, that's what that's what you want. Uh, yes, sir. Do you have an approximate number of repeat offenders? Um, I do. I can tell you. Um, I want to before I tell you that I want to say you have to first of all you have to recognize that the population that I'm dealing with are um, are the most difficult. They have mental and physical injuries as well as addictions, multi, multiple um, um, issues. Um, and so of the, in, it's a two year long process and we have 50, 54 that have been graduated through the program and we have what we call a re-arrest rate and that is 15%, which is actually um, a, a, a very, very low number for the population that we're dealing with. Uh, when you talk about prison recidivism is, you know, like close to 50, okay? Um, we have a number of, uh, what we do find though is that people that go through the program and um, quit or decide that they don't want to do it, uh, their arrest rates are pretty significant. Uh, but the graduates do very, very well. Uh, there, are, there is a, a number of people that have been through the program, but they didn't graduate. Uh, they just you know, kept getting recycled, recycled, and then uh, there was the time to supervise them had expired. So um, they're what we call um, non-traditional um, discharges. Okay, as opposed to our traditional discharge, which is a graduation. So we've had a number that go through, but again, not everybody makes it through the program. It's more difficult. Uh, I was saying I see these guys every two weeks, and I say guys, they're men and women. Um, and I staff their cases every week. I know their families, I know their children, I know their brothers. Uh, I supervise two, uh, about 2,500 probationers, okay? and 
Most of them I never see. But this particular group, that's what I'm saying. A lot of them will say, oh, I'm a veteran. And then when they figure out what, you know, what being in the veteran court is, they're like, ah, you know, I don't know if I want to see that judge every two weeks. I don't know if I really want to be accountable uh, for my actions. So it is, it, it is by no means um, a free pass. It's anything. But these are people that are taking the hard way. You know, these are the people that are taking the challenge of dealing you know, with the issues and the, and the causes that, that put them where they are. It's the tough road. You know, okay, yes, ma'am. One more question, and then you can talk afterwards, but I'm okay. just aware of the time. Yes, ma'am. So I'm imagining that um, the structural change in the community, that the community, that you have to do a lot of public relations building for your program. I did. I did. I was I was passionate. I went to community leaders, to um, you know um, everybody in that community. I mean, um, I rallied. I rallied the troops. And it's ongoing. I'm imagining it's an ongoing process. Yes, we've gone from my court in Texas to um, uh, courts in San Antonio, um, Dallas, um, El Paso, all of these places where we have major uh, veteran populations. Yes, a lot of them are mentors, are graduates, typically mentors, like I was talking about First Sergeant Davis. Uh, he's a, he is a mentor, and again, work with Mental Health America uh, to do that. And that's a, it's just an awesome resource. And I think, could I take one more? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, go ahead yes, Karen. you. Well, I appreciate, but a lot of it has to do with being in the position that I'm in. And I was saying about as a as a prosecutor, you know, I couldn't talk to people that were accused. And as when I was a defense lawyer, I thought I was pretty good defense lawyer. But all they wanted me to do was get them out of this situation, right? But as a judge, I can actually, you know, hands-on guide, mentor, or help, and make a real change that I could never that that I never ever had before. And uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My question was, are other states copying this Oh, yeah. In fact, and I want to make clear that, that I was not the first. I got, um, it was uh, Buffalo, and I looked at what they were doing, and then I just looked at, you know, gosh, we can do this in Houston, and we can do it on a grand scale because we had this DeBakey VA Medical Hospital and all of this expertise, and we have, you know, these veteran, this veteran population that's gigantic. So, yeah, okay. All right, good. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay, so we have one more thing to do before I invite you to, to there's some refreshments in the back, and of course you could talk to Judge Carter. Unbeknownst to Judge Carter, I reached out to his assistant, Vanessa Guerrero, and told her about a tradition that has grown up around this award recently. We've been able, over the last several years, to include testimony from those who have benefited from the work of the recipient of the Praxis Award. So this year, Vanessa helped me to arrange to have four veterans, returning warriors, share their thoughts about Judge Carter and the Veterans Court. So we're going to listen to them now on the screen. My name is Jim Rush, Captain, U.S. Army, helicopter pilot, Republic of Vietnam. Four years ago, I came before Judge Carter on a charge of aggravated assault. He gave me the opportunity to come through the veterans court system instead of the regular court. He told me at the time it would be more intensive, higher standards, closer scrutiny, and supervision. And he kept his word on that. 
He gave me guidelines, goals, a course of action to complete this, and best of all, a structured reality. Part of the things that we as veterans miss on leaving the service and coming back to civilian life is we've lost our, our goal. We've lost sight of where we're going. And trying to re-grasp that and reorient to civilian life can be devastating when you have other consequences from your service. I, like many others, with what I call the walking wounded. My body was back in the States, but my heart and soul was still in country with the people that I lost. I had lost my way. I was going through the down cycle of a continuous up manic and down depressive. I was severely depressed, giving away everything I owned, money, everything. When Judge Carter saw me. He saw more in me at the time than I saw in myself. What he gave me was that structure. He gave me a purpose. He helped me reorient to my life to find a goal. That's what he's done for all the veterans. Judge Carter has a passion for the law. He has compassion for the people that come before him. But make no mistake, compassion does not mean leniency. There are consequences that he's taught us. It may not always be our fault what happened to us, but it is our responsibility. He's given us the opportunity, the wherewithal, to take that responsibility, to build on it, and to reestablish ourselves as assets to society and to ourselves. For what Judge Carter has done these last four years for me and the others that I've seen come through this program, Judge Carter is my hero. He should be everybody's hero. Thank you. My name is Dwayne Perez, Sergeant, United States Marine Corps, Persian Gulf War veteran. I served two deployments overseas. After my time in the Marine Corps, I found myself losing my way in and out of jail for public intoxication. And I had a wonderful script for some fantastic medication that uh, was on the narcotic side, of which I also developed a tolerance to. Being that sometimes the prescribed medication was not enough and found myself self-medicating. After a period of years with this cycle, I found myself with felony criminal mischief charge. It was then that I found out about Harris County Veterans Court. I was told that if I were to do what was required of me, that I would be given a set of tools and that I would have to do the work so that I could get better. Now, I had never been given this opportunity to actually do the work and to help that inner child grow up. I thought that joining the military was enough, but it was not. So when I first met Judge Carter in his courtroom, it was very clear to me already, and he asked me if I was willing to do the work. And it was a no-brainer to me, either to do the work or go to jail. But the work doesn't necessarily continue once I graduate. Uh, having had an early probation termination and I graduated, I was honored to be asked to return back to Harris County Veterans Court because I have the experience of the horror 
of having to show up in court every time I show up to court I it's as as if I know what everyone in the courtroom that is starting to go through the program is having to go through so the experience that I bring is having to having gone through the Harris County Veterans Court and the love and support of the court staff and my experience of the 12 step recovery is that the work doesn't stop. It continues outside of the courtroom after graduation. It's because of Judge Carter's love and support that I have a better sense of who I am and a sense of purpose in helping other people. And that's what's solidified who I am today. Thank you, Judge Carter. Uh, my name is uh, Lex Loya. I was a corporal in the United States Marine Corps. Um, I served as a machine gunner. And uh, I did uh, two tours in Iraq. I spent about two years over there. So um, I, uh, I enjoyed that part of it. Uh, I, that's what I joined to do, was to go be a machine gunner, jump out of helicopters, and do real Marine stuff. And, you know, but what happened to me, you know, what happened to a lot of guys, is that you end up paying for that stuff, you know. Everything you see and everything you do, it comes back with you. And when I got back and out of the, out of the you know, off active duty, I was, I was content with being a, uh, basically an alcoholic, angry combat Marine. That's, that's just who I thought I was going to be for the rest of my life, and that's, that's what it was. And um, I racked up lots of public intox, uh, three DWIs, and I finally had learned that um, uh, when I blacked out, that's when I got in trouble. So I would use cocaine and then I wouldn't be able to get as drunk and that would alleviate all my problems. And um, because I didn't care about myself, I didn't care about uh, anything really, um, just wanted to leave. I you know, just wanted to leave the country, do something, go back to something that was, I was comfortable, um, you know, combat somewhere. But um, eventually I got caught with um, cocaine and put in veterans court and or, or offered the opportunity to be in veterans court. Whereas, because um, it was either gonna be two, three years in jail or doing the program. So I opted to do the program and um, that's when I really met Judge Carter and, and the staff. And uh, it's such a unique environment that, that I found myself in and with the, with the other veterans because initially I had, I had thought and, and really for the first few months, I was like, well, I'm still gonna leave the country, but I'll stay doing what they tell me to do for a little while. You know, and then at some point I just could see that, that my relationships were better and just overall my life was better. And that was directly because of this court and, uh, and very much so because of J Judge Carter. I mean, it's, it, was a, it took a lot of the stress away from, my, uh, from having to come to court and I, I knew what to expect and, and knew what was asked of me, and um, no, if, if it hadn't been for Veterans Court, I would probably be in dead or in, you know, in jail somewhere. Um, so, no, uh, it's a wonderful program. Judge Carter is a wonderful person. Uh, the staff is great. And, uh, I'd like to see this thing grow and, and continue the way it is, because it's extremely positive. And, um, thank Judge Carter for that. Uh, my name is Sergeant Marty Gonzalez, United States Marine Corps. Um, my story starts back in 2004. I, I was uh, deployed to Fallujah, Iraq. Um, out there, uh, I received an injury uh, in December 12th, uh, which broke my back. December 13th, I received a gunshot wound uh, to my right arm that ended my uh, tear out in Iraq. Um, I came home after that. Um, I wasn't supposed to be here for my son's birth. I was actually supposed to be deployed still. 
Um, I was shot December 13th, and uh, my son was born January 13th. Um, through this time, I was having a rough time. I wanted to be back out with my guys, um, just fighting and, and being by their side. I uh, brought home a lot of survivor guilt, and uh, it was really eating me up. And the nightmares were really bad, and I really couldn't think straight, be straight, and uh, you know, so alcohol was a big part, uh, you know, um, just drinking uh, every day, trying to drown the pain of not being out there fighting with my guys and not really knowing what was going on. You know, um, it was just one thing after another, and uh, I didn't really ask for help when I was going to get help, it was kind of one of those things where I was just going through the motions. I was going through the motions being a father. I was going through the motions just being a man. Uh, eventually it caught up to me. Um, one night on a Friday night sometime in 2008, um, in April, uh, I took uh, uh, too many painkillers and too many uh, muscle relaxers eventually got behind the wheel with my two-year-old son in the car and parked my uh, car into someone's living room on a Friday night. Luckily, no one was home. Luckily, I was able to put my son in the seat belt and in his car seat. Um, I shouldn't have been on the road. I don't have any excuse for that, and I'll never have an excuse for that, other than I gave up on myself during this time. Uh, I just didn't care anymore. I didn't care if I lived or died, but I wasn't gonna kill myself. But the same aspect, I just didn't care. I didn't, wasn't doing anything positive in my life. Uh, and anything that I was, it was just going through the motions. Um, so basically what I, how I talk in this, this area of my life is, I was just, you know, giving up. And there was no, there was no light, nothing. And uh, I couldn't see a purpose to keep fighting, you know, and um, when I hit this, when I hit into this house, all of a sudden, a light went off inside of me, you know, and I was just, just gross with myself, looking into myself, you know, all the stuff that I've done in the military, all the things that I've done in my whole life, just to realize that I had been giving up on myself and I, I just didn't know where I was, you know, where I was at. Uh, but I knew I wasn't this felon. I knew I wasn't this DUI felon with a child passenger in my car. Um, so I was introduced to Judge Carter, but not in a happy or fun way, you know. And, uh, but I knew I needed help. And when I asked for help, the court uh, here, the Veterans Court wasn't set up. And... Um, we pushed for a pretrial diversion, uh, and Judge Carter and the, you know, the um, DA were all looking at us like, good luck, you know, good luck on, you know, doing this. Um, but yet, they didn't know anything about me other than I wrecked my car into a house, and rightfully so, I didn't deserve anything that I was asking for, but I wanted to earn it. and. Judge Carter and the DA's office and everybody in the courtroom uh, helped, helped me out and they were able to allow this and let me try it uh, once they realized my military record and realized that I needed help versus prison. Um, so it was, a, it was a really long road of probation, uh, drug testing, everything that I had to do, but I wanted to prove myself I wanted to prove myself to Judge Carter, and I didn't want to let him down. And uh, I still don't want to let the guy down. You know, uh, he's been huge in my life. Uh, he's made me realize not, you know, not to give up, not to, not to uh, just look at the the uh, dark side. Uh, uh, you know, when it's hard. Um, so he's a uh, Push me to help him uh, push the court further. Uh, we went to Austin. 
we got the veterans court um we got the veterans court pushed all through texas uh now it's really a uh, big deal going on here in houston it's 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 an honor and a privilege to be one of the be the first person to go through and help judge carter uh you know show a success story share my story uh and be out there but really he's the story you know because if he wouldn't have uh, gave me this opportunity uh i would be probably dead you know uh i probably would have ended uh my road uh and there's really no more than i can say than he deserves it, this award he deserves anything that he gets and uh he he works for it and any chance that he gives me you know i would i would i would greatly you know fight for him and anything that the veterans court needs to do because it's saving lives it's it's helping these guys realize that there's something more you know than you, you know just giving up on yourself or coming home and realizing you're not alone you're not the only ones going through your problems you know don't don't give up here here's a set of guys going through the same thing and now we can team up and now we got each other's back and now we can keep each other accountable again see when we get out we kind of lose that that uh brotherhood stuff you know when you when you're in the military there's a band of brothers but when you get out for some reason we think we're alone but we're not you know there there's other people out there there's other veterans there's other there's other humans that just want to help you and we have to go and reach out sometimes and and uh as a veteran or you know as a human we have to ask for help and just realize you're not alone and uh Judge Carter and and the veterans court as has honestly done that for veterans and they'll continue to keep doing that and i just want to say thank you My name is Tony Gonzalez. I'm Marty's wife, and this is our daughter, Emery Pearl. We, she's only 16 days old, so she's a newbie to the world. Um, I first met Judge Carter when I met Marty and uh, heard about what happened and the second chance at life that Judge Carter gave my husband. And instantly I had respect and admiration for, for Judge Carter for taking it upon himself to help veterans better their lives when they come home because they all struggle and any wife of a combat veteran or any veteran for that matter knows the dark secrets and struggles that they face every day. So for someone to look at my husband as a person and a human being when he made the mistakes he did and gave him a second chance is pretty amazing and he has been an integral part of our lives ever since. Uh, in fact, if she was a boy, her name would have been Carter after Judge Carter. So we'll have to try again, maybe. Maybe Judge Carter will be able to pull out a namesake for you. Um, but he married us almost two years ago to the date. And then uh, Marty was in surgery last year, and he spent our first anniversary with us in the hospital, too. Brought me flowers and a card because he couldn't get out of the hospital to do it for me, so Judge Carter bought it for me. Um, he is really... I I love Judge Carter, and he didn't even help me at that time because I didn't wasn't even in the picture when Marty got in trouble. But because of the second chance, we were able to meet, we were able to get married, we were able to make this beautiful baby, and now we have a wonderful life together, and that's because of Judge Carter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, guys, I just want to say thank you. And now, um, after seeing that, you can understand how easy it is to be, you know, passionate ab about these people. And in, in, in every one of them, um, I'm sure you recognize again, you know, that warrior ethos, um, taking care of one another. And uh, so uh, that was really wonderful that you did that. And you can see, I get. It was nice to see that Marty gets emotional about me because I always get emotional when I talk about him. <laughs> so thank you.